we're looking at William Wordsworth today. Um, last class we looked at the Romantic movement in general and mentioned William Blake. Uh, I didn't get into Blake as much as I would have liked to have. There's more material on Blake on my YouTube channel if you wanted to explore Blake a little further. Uh, but I don't want to uh, try and fix what I didn't do last time and then cut out Wordsworth because Wordsworth is a more important poet. And the author, at least commonly, is uh, considered to be the uh, founder of the Romantic movement in literature in England with a collection of poets called the Lyrical Ballads, published in 1798. And um, if you read the preface to Lyrical Ballads, which we're not going to do here in this class, I do that in my Lit Theory class in my course in dedicated to Romanticism. We get into the theory a bit more. But in that preface, he argues for a poetic revolution of sorts that will pretty much uh, follow the contours of the French Revolution, the political event that took place in France nine years earlier. Um, obviously, the implications of what Wordsworth is writing here in terms of poetry are less um, seemingly less consequential and also less uh, serious in terms of the violence that is unleashed and the social implications, but we shouldn't underestimate the nature of what Wordsworth proposes in the lyrical ballads, and I'm just going to give you a, a short summary and then we'll look at the poems rather than an extended analysis, um, but he proposes to do very much what we saw Blake did last time, which is to change the traditional focus of of poetry away from virtue, the aristocracy, the representatives of virtue. The, the word aristocrat means the best, the rule of the best, or the, the best get the power. Aristos means best in Greek, and krat is, is reference to power. So democracy is the power, the people get the power, the demos gets the power. Um, and this is very much a, a uh, I wouldn't say, well, it is. It's a revolution against that form of poetics and a lot of things that go with it. And many of the things that Wordsworth will support as subject matter for poetry are things that we are going to take for granted, and we probably shouldn't because there is a genuine significant shift in the period in the uh, objects of the poetry. So as I said last time when we saw with Blake, he will write poetry about children and about uh, vagrants, or in other words, criminals. Um, he will write it about, and Wordsworth himself will write a poem called The Mad Mother. Uh, he will write about um, often solitary individuals, individuals that have been alienated by society. Um, so people on the margins get attention. And, and I last time started off with a picture of slides of, uh, to depict it in painting. This, um, because the Renaissance focus in painting, if you think about, I don't know if you, how much knowledge you have of painting, but if I put a, a typical Renaissance painting up here, let's say Da Vinci and then what? Madonna. That's very much. Character, oh gosh, and it goes, to, okay, so there it is. So what you have here, front and center, is the focus of the painting. It's very much in the form of a triangle. There's a certain golden mean represented there, but the, the focus is front and center on what the subject matter of the, of the painting is. There is background there, but it is very much in the background. You're not paying attention to the background. It's, it's, it's setting, but it's not the central focus. The central focus is on in this case, Madonna and child. Sometimes y you will find it, and it's often the nativity of some sort, uh, but it could also be wise men. It could be a any religious subject. That will be the f central focus, be right front and center. In the Romantic period, there is very much attention. Um, uh, 
Uh, Holman, oh, I shouldn't have put Hunt painting. What's a, just put romantic painting and I'll illustrate images. We can find all sorts of things here. So you can see front and center here that there is somebody front and center, but his back is to us. He's looking into the background and the background is of interest to him. That's what he's surveying. Now note that he's how he's on a mountain top. And so he's, he's climbed the pinnacle, but he's looking into the distance, which is murky and obscure. We can't see into it, but there's significance to this posture. And it is a posture. It's a, it, it's a, it's a statement to some degree that I'm paying attention to things that are l observed less in general. And this period starts to do that in general, I would suggest. It starts to look at the margins, the peripheries, the unnoticed, and is going to elevate those things to the point of prominence. You'll see it in, in the period that follows us, the Impressionists, that rather than a focused center, we'll, we'll get uh, the, the Monet's very much colored by, um, by emotion. Monet. You know Monet, maybe you don't. There's one. Oh, what are you doing? I click on a picture and then it gives me something else. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, solutions to my incompetence are always welcome. Genuinely. So, but th you get a sense of this. This is a sort of painting that you would never find before this period. And, and what do you see this? Well, this is a sun setting and creating a certain, the colors on the water and so forth, but it, it expresses something. And what it expresses is not something that you see, but rather something that you feel. That's being brought out in the painting. There's a certain sense of an, an, an attention to something that is lesser observed. And what's lesser observed are, are the emotions as opposed to the, the guidance of reason. The classical age is going to emphasize the importance of rationality and clarity and, and focus as the center of Western thought. We're going to focus on that. The Enlightenment do doubles down on this and says that reason is the means of ordering society. And I've already suggested how that plays itself out in architecture. In Louis XIV's Versailles, it's the city or it's the palace that's up above the earth and, and looks onto the horizon and sees nothing. It's a lot like that picture here. This man is very much like the palace of Versailles. He's looking out into the horizon. But now note that his back is to us and we are looking where he's looking. The, 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 the important thing is what he's looking to, not him. He represents us. Now he's a solitary climbing to the summit of the mountain and he's doing something rather difficult, which is to scale the mountain and rather dangerous. That becomes the perspective of the romantics to some degree. It's the solitary individual looking at a, into the distance uh, and noticing things that society has not paid attention to hitherto and is going to give prominence to those things. So it's very much of a revolutionary perspective on what ought to be the subject matter of poetry, but also to pay attention to what is important in that background. And what is important in the background is not reason, but feeling. And so in the Romantic period, there is a, if, if the Enlightenment is marked by intense rationalism, detached from everything, the view from nowhere, the Romantic period is marked by an intense irrationalism, an, an attention to our, our feelings, and Wordsworth will use the word imagination, just like Blake will and all the romantics, to say that the importance in what is coming out in poetry is that we pay attention to our feelings in conjunction with nature. We're going to look at nature for the first time. That, what we see in the horizon there is nature. Let me say something else about that. The word nature in the romantic period is our word nature. We've inherited it from the romantics. It's not the view of nature that existed prior to this period. If you want, <coughs> want uh, 
more substance on that, have a look at C.S. Lewis's book, Studies in Words, and look at the entry on nature. <clears throat> he, it's a really interesting book, and it is, as the title suggests, the study in words, but as they develop over the course of, of time. And Lewis observes that the word nature, come the Romantic period, has the associations that we attribute to it to this day, which is basically good. If it's natural, it's good. And it has a sense of a, a sanctity about it as well. Something that's good, something that is holy, something that is even sacred. That is the romantic view of nature. It's Wordsworth's view of nature. And it, in, and it initiates uh, something that we're also well acquainted with by now, the idea that the earth is sacred and that human beings have, by their very presence, desecrated it. So the beginning of the modern environmental movement is the Romantic period. It's associated with irrationalism, it's associated with feeling, it's associated with a sense of alienation, social alienation, and an attempt to recover that through the work of the poetic imagination. That's what happens in this period. And Wordsworth is the greatest spokesman for that movement. His poetry is deeply moving and he is a highly effective writer. Uh, so the subject matter is, is common folk. The attention's on the feelings. Uh, he will appeal to the imagination, but he will also invoke the imagination of the audience. He'll find us being sympathetic to his subjects. That's his aim, is to draw our feelings into such close proximity to the subjects that we don't just feel sympathy for them, we feel empathy for them. We feel like we're inside the characters. That's his aim. Now, that's not an aim of foregoing poets. They don't want us to inhabit the person being depicted, put our feelings in their feelings. But after Wordsworth and the Romantics, that is the aim of poetry and arts in general. They want us to have, a, it's a psychological movement um, that the poet is bringing about and, it, and it's giving quasi-religious significance. And that will, it will start to characterize uh, reading texts even. It's called hermeneutics. <laughs> it's not interpretation. That the, the words are usually taken as synonyms. They are not synonyms. Hermeneutics is inhabiting the person uh, and seeing things through their eyes, yet, yet believing that you can know better than the person who felt those things. So for example, in biblical studies, which you will best know, the author Friedrich Schleiermacher, the father of modern liberalism, uh, theology, theologically speaking, um, says that we can know as well, if not better than the original authors. And the reason why is because we have historical distance from those people. And so we can project our feelings into them or we can feel their feelings. And yet, because we can see that we think differently than them, we can see how much we've made progress on their worldview. So yes, the Apostle Paul wrote this. He wrote this about women, about, um, about homosexuality, whatever, but we don't share his views on, on certain topics. Our, our culture has moved on. So the act of reading is both understanding his perspective and at the same time not sharing it, because we know better. So, we can, so if we pr imagined that we were a first century Pharisee, Pharisaic Jew, trained as he was in the culture of his day, deeply educated, we would also know that that worldview had certain ideas uh, and they would be common in his day, but they're not common in, in our day <coughs> or they are contested. So where they differ, we can beg to disagree and we can do it in sympathy with Paul and yet no, make improvements on there. Therein lies the progress. It's basically saying Paul's wrong <laughs> about the things on which we disagree or our culture differs on that. So romanticism, and let me give you another definition. This is from Friedrich Schlegel. He's a German author of the period. He calls it progressive universal poetry. Progressive universal poetry. <coughs> and it involves inhabiting um, the feelings of others and universalizing them. 
And as I say, it has a decided theological uh, implication, even if it's not theological, at the very least it's spiritual. And the effect is what another author, Th Thomas Carlyle, who's a famous Victorian poet, calls natural supernaturalism. It sees the supernatural in the natural. It posits the presence of God in the physical order, not in the murkiness, but rather in it's in the matter. The matter is not divine, but what you can't see in the matter is. So God is everywhere in everything. Theologically, we'd call it panentheism. God is in everything. This is not, it's a variation on pantheism, but everything's divine. So if you've heard of Deepak Chopra and so forth, it's an emanation of the same type of thinking. Anyway, let me move to this. Um, nope, nope, that's not the one I wanted to look at. This one is, first one. This is just one of the collection of poems from lyrical ballads, it's called We Are Seven, and the subject matter is a child. A child speaking to an adult who's lost a sibling, in fact, not just one sibling. And uh, one of the uh, comments that Wordsworth appends to this, it's not here on the page behind me, is uh, how we are taught to lie by adults. How children are taught to lie. That's not a direct quote, but that's the gist of it. How do children learn to lie? Because remember what I said last time, the romantics deny original sin. They uh, do think that sin comes about, but it comes about uh, through social means, through the use of language, through socialization, through social pressure, etc. then people are brought to commit sin, but they're not born in sin. Sin is not intrinsic to the human condition after Adam and Eve. We don't inherit original sin. We're not, sub we're not uh, the... Uh, the heirs of Adam and Eve in that sense. We haven't inherited that aspect of their nature. We commit sin ourselves after the fact, but it's not um, part of who we are, in which case it's possible to avoid it, in which case also we want to give an account for what constitutes the thing that pushes us towards sin, and the thing that pushes us towards sin is invariably socialization and the pressures that come from cultural uses of language. They make us say and think things that we don't actually feel are true. That's how sin comes about. And th this uh, move from innocence to experience, to use Blake's terms, is basically unavoidable. As children grow, they become socialized, and as they become socialized, they are taught to lie and they, they bring about a sort of a, a fall occurs. And the solution to this remedy or this, this problem of, of sin uh, is through the imagination reunifying us with nature, bringing us back to nature and seeing a commonality because the lie sees differentiation there and romanticism wants to heal that differentiation by drawing us who where is this picture, are in the, there he is, we'll get rid of that. Who's got his back into the background, he will, it will bring him in union with what he sees in the murky distance, so that he uh, is one with the natural world. That's the w way of repairing the fall. But how does the fall actually come about to begin with? Well, this is what he depicts in We Are Seven. So let me read it first of all. We are seven. A simple child that lightly draws its breath and feels its life in every limb, what should it know of death? I met a little cottage girl. She was eight years old, she said. Her hair was thick with many a curl that clustered round her head. She had a rustic woodland air and she was wildly clad. Her eyes were fair and very fair. 
Her beauty made me glad. Sisters and brothers, little maid, how many may you be? How many? Seven in all, she said, and wondering looked at me. And where are they? I pray you tell. She answered, seven are we, and two of us at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea. Two of us in the churchyard lie, my brother and my, my sister and my brother, and in the churchyard cottage I dwell near them with my mother. Now the adult. You say that two at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea, yet ye are seven? I pray you tell, sweet maid, how this may be. The adult immediately notices. You say that there are seven, and two of them are dead. There, you, there aren't seven. Then did the little maid reply, Seven boys and girls are we, two of us in the churchyard lie, beneath the churchyard tree. You run about, my little maid, your limbs, they are alive. If two are in the churchyard laid, then ye are only five. Their graves are green, they may be seen, the little maid replied, twelve steps or more from my mother's door, and they are side by side. My stockings there I often knit, my kerchief there I am, and there upon the ground I sit and sing a song to them. And often after sunset, sir, when it is light and fair, I take my little porringer, which is again something for sowing, and eat my supper there. The first that died was Sister Jane. In bed she moaning lay, till God released her of her pain, and then she went away. So in the churchyard she was laid, and when the grass was dry, Together round her grave we played, my brother John and I. And when the ground was white with snow and I could run and slide, my brother John was forced to go, and he lies by her side. How many are you then, said I, if they too are in heaven? Quick was the little maid's reply, Oh, master, we are seven. But they are dead. Those two are dead. Their spirits are in heaven. "'Twas throwing words away, for still the little maid would have her will and said, "'Nay, we are seven. <clears throat> it's very artfully done. It's like Blake. The diction is simple. Note this as well. There's no fancy neoclassical diction in it. It's very simple. The language is um, childlike using words that any child would know of Wordsworth's day. And he's happy not only to have the setting being uh, a child and an adult, which is a, not a typical setting for a, a poet to pay attention to, but also to make the language very common day, commonsensical, a sort of a dialogue that would take place very realistically and make that the subject matter of the poem. And Wordsworth is initiating something that will not go away. Uh, today, people write poetry and will talk about it in using their own language. They won't want to use a different type of diction for poetry. They'll, they'll want to write the way they speak. They won't see a difference in a, a stylistic difference. Or if they do, they'll want to avoid the stylistic difference. And I want to write more like I speak. So there'll be a privileging of the spoken word over the written word and in general rebellion against learning in favor of <coughs> a lowest common denominator, which is everyone speaks and talks in the same words and uses vocabulary that everyone can understand. And there's a sort of an anti-intellectualism that creeps in here. Now, Wordsworth is not anti-intellectual, but the move towards privileging speech over writing is part of the whole romantic movement as well. And it will result in a change in the poetry of the period. It becomes more, it becomes less artful and more natural, we would say. So there's a turn against art in favor of nature. So this is the second illustration. I said that the Romantics' uh, view of nature is they divinize it, they see it as sacred, they see it as holy. And I said that we share their perspective. And you, if you doubt me, if I gave you almost anything, let's say to eat, and told you it was artificial, 
would you prefer that or would you prefer the organic or natural food? You would instantly prefer the organic, instantly. What's the difference between a, an organic form of food and a cultivated form? You can get wild blueberries and you can get cultivated blueberries. What's the difference? Sure. Well, you, the, the nice words, strictly enforced. It's cultivated, but the stricture sounds like you're doing violence to nature by cultivating it. And somehow you're ruining something of the goodness of the, of the blueberry by cultivating it, which directly goes against the dominion mandate given to Adam and Eve to cultivate the garden, be fruitful and multiply, fill and subdue the earth. To, to, in other words, to bring about agriculture. Agriculture is the intervention of humanity into the natural order and the, the attempt to improve it, to make it fruitful. It was there in the garden before Adam and Eve fell. They, they would involve themselves in the natural world and seek to improve it. They'd cut back the weeds. They would prune certain things so it would be, grow more fruitful. They would be involved in, as I say, agriculture. They would plow the ground. They had to, believe it or not, break the soil violate the, the, the sacred earth in order to plant seeds and cultivate it. And again, you can start to make, you can do this with, with crops, you can do it with animals, you can do it in terms of hunting, you cull the herd, you, there's a hunting season and so forth. There's a, there's a, 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 go back to what I said about the garden in the Palace of Versailles and look at the relation of culture to nature. There's a very clear uh, strictly rationally demarcated view of culture and nature. Very rational, very orderly, maybe too much so. But the point is that there is an involvement there and it doesn't desecrate the earth to involve yourself in it. But from the romantic point of view, any involvement in nature is making what's good worse. Worse, just by involving yourself in it because it's sacred. And that gives rise to the whole notion that persists to this very day in the radical green environmental movement that even human beings propagating and being fruitful and multiplying is producing carbon footprints and effectively destroying the earth. And the best form thing that we can do with nature is let nature be natural. Note that the word nature does not occur in scripture. The word is creation. Creation implies a creator. Nature suggests something that's there without an author, as if it were eternal. That's the romantic view of nature. It has an origin, and the origin's sacred, but it's not God. If it were God, then we could, we could point or at least address God's relation to the natural world and uh, conduct ourselves accordingly. But we will get rid of the word creation and creator and appeal to nature. And that's a very different thing because God in scripture is personal and we bear his image. In the natural conception of things, human beings are organic beings just like animals and just like the grass and the smoke in the horizon there, it's just part of nature, non-differentiated, everything sacred. And if everything's sacred, the human being, which in, from a scriptural understanding alone bears the image of God, is reduced to organic matter just like everything else. So it's, a, it's actually, and this is not explicit in what I'm saying here, but it's an implicit consequence and a downstream consequence. This gives rise to post-humanism, which is prevalent in our day. Yes? In the garden narrative, isn't there... Now in Genesis. Yes. Isn't, there, isn't it that God had actually created everything as it was, and the human as a human were to care for it as it is? Mm -hmm. Not Guard and protect is what the command was given to Adam. Instead of garden to tend and to and protect. I'm thinking of the, the back to your question of do you want the artificial or, or natural or organic? And now we seem to have swung. Yeah.
Has anyone done any gardening here? When you want your uh, garden to grow better, what's the first thing that you do besides water it? You fertilize it. What's in the fertilizer? Chemicals, right? Right? So what you're doing by, you're, you're making the ground, which is fruitful, more fruitful. And that's an intervention already. Now the cows will go and drop their dung on the ground and so forth, but you're actually just picking up the dung and you're, you're, you're plowing up the ground and you're putting the dung into the ground and, that, and the nutrients from that make the earth, which is already capable of bearing life to be more capable and you get better, more fruitful agriculture as a consequence of that. And you can cut out the weeds and so forth, but you're already introducing chemicals which come from the earth back into the earth. So it is an artificial means if you want it, and I take art in a general sense, it is an intervention of humanity in the natural processes that brings out what is good in nature and makes it even more so. And then you, you can cut out things that are in nature that you don't want there. You don't want certain poison berries in and around where you're gonna have the plants and they're gonna create certain, you take those out. It's an involvement. Man has a place in the garden is the point. And being involved in the gardening is not a violation of nature. It's what it's it's part of the dominion mandate. So the right balance, and yes, can you put acid in the ground, a chemical, hydrochloric acid? Can I pour it in the ground and kill everything there? Of course I can. So I put the wrong kind of chemicals, but putting chemicals in is not ipso facto wrong. Right? You just have to put the right kind of chemicals. Now you get into the GMO stuff and we're getting a little bit far off the beaten path, but is that right then? Well, that's an ethical debate then. But just putting chemicals into it is not a problem. Otherwise, you can't really be a productive farmer. Simply can't. And you have to feed your animals well. You gotta give them what, what makes them thrive. You can feed them on other things. Well, then that's gonna affect the, the quality of the meat, the product of the milk, whatever. If you give them food that they're not supposed to eat, then it's gonna be bad for the animals and it's not gonna be good for you as a farmer either and you're gonna eat food that probably should not be poisoned by what you fed the animals on, but cows eat grass. That's what they eat. Well, you can put nutrients in the grass and make the grass more nutrition, it's better for the cows, sure. Or you can feed the cows who knows what, grain. Cows don't eat grain, but you can give them to make them fatter. Is it gonna do something to the quality of the food along the way at the end of that chain? I think it does. So again, but those are prudential. What does this creature that we call a cow naturally eat? What should we give it so that the cow becomes a better cow, a healthier, happier cow, as, which makes for a better food supply, if you will? Right, th those are, but, it, but the, the whole point is, is it wrong to intervene in nature? And the answer is no, it's not, it's simply not. Same with hunting and fishing. You, if you don't call populations, then you, you get problems. The sort of David Suzuki, the you let nature be nature stuff is banana stuff, cuckoo bananas. That's a technical term, cuckoo bananas. Um, from your English prof, yeah. Don't quote me in an essay, cuckoo bananas. But back to this poem, the little maid has pointed out to the adult that there are seven of them, and we know what both sides are saying here, right? We know what both sides are saying. He's saying, well, two of them are dead, so there's no longer seven of you, there's only five of you. And you have to recognize that what death means is that people are gone. They're not there anymore. And her point is, I can see the graves. I'm by where the, I know who they were. I'm by them and I remember them. And so they're still alive to me in some sense. And that's important to me. And the adult wants to say, no, it's not. They're dead, they're gone. And the little maid has a, a differing point of view. Now they're both correct. But what we're sympathetic to here is that the adult is misunderstanding the child. We're drawn to the child's side. The child is the hero of this poem. The adult is probably not intentionally, but is sort of making the child to think like an adult. Just this is the, like when you grow up, you'll understand what is, 
but is the child not correct in some sense? And the, the, the obvious, obvious answer is yes, in some sense. And yet the child is going to become eventually like the adult and think like the adult and probably have the same conversation later in life with another child to acquaint them. Well, death means that they're not coming back. You, you know that. Every child knows that they're not coming back. But the child says, no, but there's something that lives on of that person with me. And what the, what the poem then is introduces, there's a spiritual nature to humanity that the adults deny that the children can see. I think that's the suggestion in the poem at any rate. Yes? Yeah, so from the second paragraph up, where it says, how many are you then? No, right there. How yep. many are you then, said I. We are two heavens. Quick, was resolu quick resolution made this side of the master. Doesn't that quick resolution made? So normally when you lie, well, some people at least, you will quickly recite to cover up the, the lies that they've already said. Doesn't that well, mistake on her part shows that she has an understanding of the death, but is trying to cover it up with the memories of her siblings and still trying to put forth that thing. She's trying to defend her position, yeah. Yeah, but doesn't that also show that she has an understanding? Like they are it seems like, yeah, yeah. If they too are in heaven, she knows that they're in heaven because she, she says the first that died, she uses the word, line 49. First that died, she knows the difference between life and death, and yet she still insists that we are seven. I have seven siblings, or there are seven of us, me and my six siblings, that's how many there are. And the adult says, oh no, that's, that's not the case. So they're talking about two different things, clearly. She knows that they're dead, and they are in heaven, but they are still my siblings, and we are still seven. They're saying different things, they're talking at cross purposes. And but she wants to hold on to something that she thinks is important and the adult wants her to get over and she doesn't want to get over it. And so that sense is what it's doing. Uh, the effect of this is to make us look at something in a different way than we would normally look at it. Adults, pay attention to the way the child is looking. Let the child and the way the child sees things inform the way you see things because you're like the adult and you've forgotten what it's like to think as a child. And maybe you've lost something in the process. A, a connection between people that are not right in front of your eyes at all times, etc. So that's the first poem. It's good, right? It's, and it's, it's simple, it's light, it's written in very simplistic language. It's written with rhyme but they're not rhyming couplets, alternating lines here, quatrains throughout. Very simplistic though, right? Iambic uh, tetrameter. Yes? Up more? Ah. No, but uh, you're correct and well noticed. So whenever you're studying a poem, and I, I would have just skipped right over it. Whenever you're studying a poem, note the, rep what, note the things that are repeated and note the variations. These are two artistic principles, repetition and variation. Um, that holds to almost all artistic endeavors. What's the, what's the pattern that is established? And then do we stick to the pattern? If we stick to the pattern, we start to find it re repetitive and boring. And often we will find that the artist first establishes a pattern, so we expect the pattern and then, and then messes with it and flips it and inverts it. And then it makes us pay attention to that very point. As soon as you expect it, then when something deviates from that, you seize upon it, pay attention to it. And so yes, she, it's emphatic at the end, we are seven, but note also before this, um, the rhyming couplet here, still will. And what's actually really standing out is this line, the, the first line, right? Because I, heaven, reply, seven, these are all rhyming. This one is not rhyming, it jumps out. 
This is what he asserts, and it breaks the rhythm of the whole poem. The order, the harmony is disrupted, not by the child, but by the adult. But they are dead. Those two are dead, and he, he willfully asserts this. It breaches the form, and then he accuses her of being willful. There were, their spirits are in heaven, Twas throwing words away, for still the little maid would have her will, and said, nay, we are seven. But note again, her, her assertion is part of the rhyming um, structure of the whole poem, whereas this stands out, this one line, he wills that they be seen as dead. And this is what society does to our feelings. It, it, it says that they're of no significance. I know that you feel that your siblings are alive. You need to get over it. Like he's imposing his rational, the adult way of looking at things on her and trying to help her grow up. And we see it as a violation of the child in some ways. He says she's willful, so is he, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, probably behind some of the yes. No, the slaughter of the innocents, as it's called in uh, scripture, which takes place um, by uh, uh, what's his name? Oh, what's the bad guy? Herod. Um, the innocents are not uh, sinless human beings. They're, the word innocent means that they're harmless. So innocent, the Latin, the in is a negation. Nocera means that no harm. They can't do any harm. A child is innocent because they can punch you in the face. And they do, by the way, babies. I've seen babies punch their mothers. <laughs> right? They don't give it the one. They go, Pfft. and everyone sort of laughs and think, oh, she didn't mean to do that. Oh, yes, she did. She pocked you right in the right in the nose, pop. and if she was stronger, it probably broke in your nose, but she doesn't have the strength because she's innocent. She can't harm you. But if she could do her will because she's red-faced and wants to get your attention for whatever reason or to punish you, she would do that, but she's innocent. It doesn't, has nothing to do with their state of sin. It has everything to do with their weakness. That's what innocent means. So the slaughter of the innocent is the slaughter of babies. That it's not a theological statement. It's a statement about their relative weakness. That's what's meant. The romantics introduce the idea of innocence and relate it to childhood and give it a theological significance. They say that they're good until they become evil. They theologize something and they misrepresent what is being said about the state of innocence thereby. And the church has been very um, negligent in seeing this. And most Christians uh, that I've been around think that children are innocent. Den they deny original sin, in other words. I could get into why that would be and uh, all that, but that's a digression from the course here. Helpful at all? Let's move on to the next poem. This is more substantive and more uh, important. This is Wordsworth's, one of his great poems. And again, it's one of the lyrical vows. Note the date, 1798. Note the subtitle. It's, a, it's technically called a loco descriptive poem. It's a description of a place. It's a mouthful. It's called Tintern Abbey. Lines composed a few miles above Tintern Abbey on revisiting the banks of the Wye during a tour, July 13th, 1798. Yes? What was the poem called again? No, no. The previous one? We Are Seven. No, no, no. Um, you said that it was a local... Lyrical ballads? No. So loco descriptive? Oh, loco descriptive. Loco as in crazy, but it's got nothing to do with lo it's location. Loco descriptive. Very common in the 18th century. They describe landscape. There are soca in the 18th century, there's something called landscape poetry, and the Romantic movement arises out of that, but it 
attribute something different to it than you would find in the 18th century, namely God. Um, I should give you a couple just so you have in your mind's eye. Maybe I'm ruining this by showing you this at the outset, but maybe I'm not. This is Tintern Abbey. It's in, it's inside Windsor. Yeah, it's inside Wales, just inside the Welsh border. Uh, there, from the inside. There, from a distance. What do you notice about Tintern Abbey? Yes. There is no roof or windows. It's a ruin. Important. Now, the, there were abbeys all over Britain until Henry VIII comes along and seizes the assets of the Catholic Church from the monastic orders and the nunneries and so forth dissolves them, seizes the assets, as I say, um, and the whole monastic orders, uh, whatever, are dissolved, their property seized, taken by the crown, etc., and, and yet they are not brought down. They're just left to, eventually the, the roof falls in and the glass breaks because the glass is made of sand and it's liquidy and it eventually it just leans down and falls through. And what you have here is a, a perfect illustration of a romantic subject. Because what does, it, what does it illustrate? It illustrates the power of nature over art in one picture. The grandeur and the power of nature in, in bringing down the work of enormous artistic energy and endeavor. I mean, the ruin still stands there, but it is a ruin. And it is associated with a aesthetic that we're gonna call the sublime. This is an important word. It's, I think I don't have to spell this for you, right? Sublime, S-U-B-L-I-M-E extraordinarily important word in the 18th century of aesthetics, which is the study of beauty. But this is a different type of beauty. In fact, it's not even beautiful at all. It's the opposite of beautiful. Without getting too deeply into the aesthetic theory of the 18th century, the beautiful is something that you can see and find um, sense power over. You find a little child beautiful, you find baby puppies beautiful, little kittens, something that is soft, weak, round, colorful, whatever. We associate that with beautiful. The sublime is the exact opposite, and in fact, they have nothing to do with one another. The sublime is something that exerts uh, in relation to which we feel powerless. Beauty, we feel power over, Sublime, we feel powerless in the face of it. We feel powerless in the face of the effects of, na of nature. The destructive power of nature, the power of nature to bring, to ruin the best of human culture. Eventually it falls just like human beings' bodies do to the forces of entropy. It just falls apart. And this illustrates how nature does it because you can even see from the inside of the abbey on the floor. It's got a nice green carpet there. <laughs> it's nice, neatly trimmed. I suspect that there were sheep that came in and were chewing up the grass so that it kept it from getting to see so a nice little lawnmowers there. But you see, there's no ceiling and there are no windows. And it suggests, again, a, a, a conjunction of art and nature. Now compare this to the Garden of Versailles. There is dominion over nature. There is a rational dominion exerted and, and creating a sense of order in it, a very straight, orderly, perfection, geometrically so. This is also a relation of nature to art, but here the, the nature uh, overpowers the art. And this is a, considered to be a greater form of art because it suggests a grandeur which we can attribute to power 
And with the association of immense grandeur and power like this can be attributed to no one other than God. God, or if you prefer, nature. Uh, he says it's composed a few miles above Tintern Abbey. So he visited this, he saw this, did Mr. Wordsworth, but he saw it was a few miles above it. Maybe he's up here. He, he was near it and then he saw it from a distance from the hill. Another picture. So how does it begin? But as I say, a sublime landscape because it, it suggests the power of nature in bringing it to ruin and also brings you to think about just like this picture, it makes you think about this bit what's not there as opposed to what is there. Very important, very important. Just like the child pays attention to what's not there as opposed to what is there, and the adult says, no, but there's only five of you left, and she says, no, we're seven. Mindful of what isn't there, the, this poem does exactly the same thing. So let me read. Five years have passed, five summers with the length of five long winters. No. I want to get it on one line, it's still not going to do it, so it doesn't matter. And again I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. Once again do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The day is come when I again repose here under this dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves mid groves and copses. Once again, I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild, these pastoral farms green to the very door and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees with some uncertain notice as might seem of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods or of some hermit's cave where by his fire the hermit sits alone. Let me just stop right there. What is your general impression here of the poem thus far? What feeling does it uh, inculcate? What's the sense in the poem? What is it drawing you to attend to? With everything we've said thus far about romanticism, making you attend to the background. What is, it, what is this poem doing? And how does it do it? Yes, sure. Good. Not necessarily death, but quiet. How does it, how does it bring attention to quietness? Breathe the smoke. Okay. Um, just a question for you. What, what, what noise does the sky make normally? What noise does the smoke make? Doesn't make any noise. Something that made the smoke might make the noise, but the smoke itself doesn't make any noise. But what are you doing? Or what's he doing by paying attention to those things? He's drawing your attention to those things. He's making you hear what you can't hear. You're leaning in. You're looking just like the man standing on the summit looking into the landscape. You're, you're paying attention to something that you is inaudible. And that's the point. You're, you're, you're supposed to be looking at what you can't see, hearing what you can't hear. He'll do it other ways through uh, elliptical uh, punctuation things like this long dash. He'll introduce the long dash as a subject matter of poetry. It's a way of punctuation, like some of us use long dashes for stream of consciousness and so forth. He's not doing stream of consciousness. He's creating a pause in the line, a long pause. 
And the long pause has the same effect as the silence. It's supposed to think about what is behind the words. Just like silence is the absence of words, it's paying attention to what isn't said as well as what is said. Okay, so very good, silence. Yes, absolutely there, and it's referred to in various ways uh, here, and, uh, and, and, and si silence and absence of order. I don't know an absence of society. That could be also be reinforced by the fact that there's a hermit there. And the hermit is surprisingly alone. What is a hermit? <laughs> Hermits are people that live on their own. So paying attention, but, you know, observing that the hermit sits alone is sort of the definition. So an odd thing, you're, 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 you're emphasizing something that doesn't need emphasis. But by doing so, you are pushing into the reader's uh, perspective something that would otherwise escape his notice. Oh yeah, there's a hermit. This is a really hermity hermit. He's a, he's in a her hermit that's in the house of woods and he's all alone. Okay, I guess. And furthermore, and this is the importance here, once again, do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene, so what does secluded mean? If you're secluded, sure. Just like tucked away, like yeah. Yeah, it's a, isolated, it's cut off, it's secluded, yes. And here, the wild secluded scene impressed thoughts of a more deep seclusion. What are secluded thoughts? I don't know the answer to this question, by the way. But, and, and neither does he. But it, it's emphasizing, again, something that is internalizing. He's saying the landscape of this external landscape is really internal. It's the feelings that I experience in conjunction with this landscape that are more important than the landscape I'm describing, just as silence is more important than the noise of my words. It's, it's suggesting that uh, those feelings that arise in this, and note they arise through memory. He, he's not describing the scene at Tintern Abbey as, as he sees it. He's remembering five years on what it was like to be there. And the memory is more potent than the actual physical observation of Tintern Abbey. He can remember. And what has happened in the intervening times? Well, the intervening times have not just been five years, they've been five very long years. How long? Well, they're five summers, or much stronger with the length of five long winters. How long does the winter last? Usually the same length, but winter is a deprivation. Summer is not. Summer is where you go outside and enjoy life. Life is fruitful. It's easier. Winter, well, in Canada, doubly so. It's maybe not right now, but it's long and it's cold. And it, it, it's, it's, the time seems longer. It's a darker time. And that's how it's been in the absence of this experience. And this experience changes his life. The presence of Tintern Abbey, which is a ruin in the midst of nature, makes him reflect on that original experience. Now, this is the pivot around which the whole poem revolves, the opening gambit. So what, what does he say then in, in response? And note the greenness here as well. There's greenness everywhere. The pastoral farms are green to the very door. The unripe hoops are cloud in one green hoop. So there's greenness, there's silence, etc. Strong, vivid uh, feelings and colors. And there's something like synesthesia as well. Because again, he talks about the smoke going up in silence. So I see the smoke, but I don't hear it. But now I think I hear it. So I'm paying as if it were an auditory thing. I can hear si smoke. You can't hear smoke. But he makes us attend to all of our senses and it's making us feel united with the landscape that he does not himself see, but he remembers. And the memory is more important than the, the sight. And he says this in the lines that follow, these beauteous forms. Now the word forms, for anyone who's read Plato, is going to have a certain resonance. The forms are the ideas, the ideal ideas. Like there are particular things and then there's the forms of the things. He talks about instances of justice and then the form of justice which is the ideal. 
right? We, we, when we say that's an unjust action, we're measuring it up to an, a, a form of that. It's a particular instance of that, a perfect instance of justice, for instance. So these beauteous forms, and he connects that with the landscape that he just saw or remembered. These beauteous forms, the, through a long absence, have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye, but oft in lonely rooms, and mid the din of towns and cities I have owed to them, in hours of weariness, sensations sweet, felt in the blood and felt along the heart, and passing into my purer mind with tranquil restoration, feelings too of unremembered pleasure, such perhaps as have no small or slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life, his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. Nor less, I trust, to them I may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime, important. You just described a landscape that was sublime. This is even more sublime, the sublime of the sublime. What is it? That blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened, a light is cast on it. That serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on. Long dash, just like a dash here as well until the, mo the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul, while with an eye made quiet by the power of, the, of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. Now, I want to go back here briefly. I'm going to say a whole bunch of things, but please just note this section here. What is he echoing in this phrase? What is happening? What is he attributing to this experience, which he remembers in the middle of cities when he's, off, he's away from the noise? He's just emphasized the importance of silence. He's in the noisy cities where there's a lot of people, not just individuals like the solitary hermit who's a sort of a heroic figure, even though he's called a vagrant, which means he's a criminal. He's in the midst of cities, and he's felt that there's something important in that original situation, which drives us to something that he calls a gift, that he attributes to being a mood in which the burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened, suddenly I can see. A mood that leads us on and then something happens. What is the something that happens here? What is he echoing here in these lines? Death. Scripture. No, it's not death. The exact opposite. Right there. Adam is put into what's called a deep sleep. And what happens? God brings Ad Eve out of his side. That phrase, deep sleep. We are laid asleep in body and become a living soul. It's a new creation is what's happening here. Here we get Eve out of Adam's side. He's in a deep sleep. Words are echoing this here, except now we don't get Eve. We get a new creation, namely us. 
what is the part of us that's put to sleep and what is the part that rises out of it? The body is put to sleep, not death, sleep, just like Adam. And what arises out of it is his soul, his disembodied soul, which is connected to his feelings, the mood that he has in conjunction with this nature. It's a process of feeling that leads us to understand ourselves as spiritual beings rather than bodily, material beings, subject to the, the five senses of reasoning and so forth. It makes us feel a spiritual or, and sense a spiritual reality about human nature with a, that we didn't sense before when we were younger. When he was five years ago, he didn't sense it. He's going to tell us this in the lines that follow this. But now in, ref, in reflection, as he's older, he can realize that something about him has changed. And he, he will talk exactly about this change. But that's, he's echoing Genesis 2. You will see the exact same sort of thing, by the way, when, uh, when uh, Abraham is put into a deep sleep by God and he, he does a, makes a covenant with him. Th that phrase, the deep sleep. Uh, also echoed, by the way, in Daniel 7, when Daniel is put into a deep sleep, that same phrase. Something's going on here. It's very important in, in each of the three passages. And God is creating something that is important for the whole human race in each of the three instances. But anyway, um, and what does it cause us? It causes us this blessed mood and the eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy we see into the life of things. So it's a visionary benefit. We can see into the life of things. It's a deeper form of vision. It's a spiritual form of vision. It's not vision with our eyes. It's with the eyes of the mind. The Philosopher Plato talks about the eyes of mind, the mind beholding the forms, the ideal forms of justice, goodness, truth, beauty, etc. That's what the philosopher does. Wordsworth is attributing this to the poet, but he's giving it a theological tenor that is not there in Plato. And it does run alongside the Christian understanding of human nature. This is the new birth. This is how you get born again from the romantic point of view. It's by having the right feelings about the world. It's a spiritual vision. It's not the holy spiritual vision. It's spiritual with a, cap, with a little s spiritual. It's a spirituality. And now he will go on with this. If this be but a vain belief, yet oh how oft in darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight, when the fretful stir unprofitable and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart. How oft in spirit have I turned to thee, O Sylvan Y. So he speaks to the river that rang, ran alongside Tintern Abbey, reflecting in memory on the significance of what lay in the background of the scene, just again like this. I've thought about this sort of landscape. I've thought about this sort of background in seeing this. I've thought about what's not there as opposed to what is there and realize that what's not there is more weighty than what is there. So it's a re there's a religiosity about this that is, that is characteristic of romanticism. A later writer calls romanticism spilt religion. It's religion that's onto the ground. It's everywhere. It makes all life religious. It's a spiritual movement. But when these things have hung on the beatings of my heart, how oft have I turned to thee? Thou wander through the woods, how often has my spirit turned to thee? And now, with gleams of half-extinguished thought, with many recognitions, dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. While here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years. Be echoing the Anglican prayer book here. And so I dare to hope, though changed, no doubt from what I was first when I came among those hills, when like a row I bounded over the mountains. So he's thinking back what he was like five years ago. 
he didn't have this perception. He was younger, but the child did not see with the imagination that the adult does. The adult has the gift that the child doesn't. The child doesn't have to imagine things because they see the connectedness of all things, but they haven't lost that sense of innocence, so they don't need the imagination to recover. But, but adults do need the imagination to recover childhood innocence, and that's what he, as an adult, brings to this scene. But back then, no doubt, so, so I dare to hope, though changed no doubt from what I was when first I came among these hills, when like a roe that is a deer, I bounded over the mountains by the st sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. For nature then, then the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by, to me was all in all. He saw himself indistinct from nature back then. He just did what was spontaneous like. He did what he wanted to do. There's a butterfly, I'll chase after the butterfly. There's this, I'll run after that. No thought, no thought whatsoever. He sees no distinction between him. He takes delight in everything around him, just like a child. I cannot paint what then I was. The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms, were then to me an appetite, a feeling, and a love that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied, nor not any interest borrowed from the eye. That was back then. That time is past, and all its aching joys are now no more, and all its dizzy raptures. A key point in the poem. Not for this faint I for the loss of this. Nor mourn, nor murmur. Other gifts have followed. For such loss, I would believe, abundant recompense. And what is that? For I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. He senses something that interfuses everything. The air, the water, the sun, the moon, the air, everything. Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods, and mountains, and of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create and what perceive, well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of sense the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart, and soul of all my moral being not in God, but in this unity with nature. And when I say nature, I don't mean what he sees when he's a, a, like in a landscape painting. It's what he sees in that, that we can't see. The, the silent, the absent thing that he sees with the, the vision, the spiritual vision of connectedness. <clears throat> and he connects his moral being with this. There's a moral effect to this to his, this sense of spiritual nature. So this is a religious, Wordsworth is a religious poem, a poet. And the Romantic movement in its best exponents, and I think Wordsworth is the best, is a profoundly religious poet. And this does not mean that he's a Christian poet, because I don't think he is. I think it, his assertions on human nature contradict Christian doctrine. 
the effect on human nature is one of the consequences of that. Um, the lack of God in the poem is deeply problematic, and it's not going to be remedied when he brings God in later as an adult. He's still an adult, but an older adult and decides he wants to make it a little bit more palatable to the, uh, to the uh, audience of his day and throw the word God in here at various points, which he won't do in this poem, but later poems he'll throw the word God in, but he still means the sense of absence in the presence of nature. Because as everybody knows, God is not nature. You can see nature, and that can't be God. But what is in, in, in the nature that you can't see, that's what he says is God. As I said, it's panentheism. It's in, all in God. It's very much like Eastern spirituality. Right, where they, they, they posit a oneness uh, that is a, a, something that you, your soul perceives, but your body cannot, and you seek to move from the body towards the soul as a consequence of spiritual development, etc. Uh, romanticism leans towards Eastern religion, it becomes very popular with that. By the way, the, the Lake District, which is the subject matter of most of Wordsworth's poetry, at least when I was in England, um, would have a huge influx of Japanese tourists every year, just like Prince Edward Island. But like half a million visitors from Japan would go to Wordsworth's um, Lake District, in part because it was put in their English syllabus as a poem. After the Second World War taught English, they, this, these were the poems that were given to them. So uh, from uh, Anne of Green Gables and Wordsworth, so then the Japanese go to these places that reminded them of uh, the way they were moved in the literature they read. But it, it fits very much with an Eastern view of life, where I, everything's an illusion. The physical world's an illusion. The reality is something you can't see that lies behind it. And as I say, the perspective is best represented here. I really think it is. The man in the center is us, but it's what he's looking into. We're sharing his perspective. Tr terrific stuff. And note it's a solitary. It's always a solitary. So it's the individual against society. Society is a corrosive influence, an artificial, uh, uh, oppressive, rational order trying to be and is crushing the feelings of our humanity. And it's for the poet to reconnect with what is really important. He does that through poetry. So it's a poetic backlash against the Enlightenment. It shares many things in common, but perspectival perspectively it inverts it. So anyway, good for today. <laughs>